Welcome to Recovery Recharged with me, Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx. How does recovery work? How do you use the tools of recovery in everyday life? How do you help someone who is learning to overcome addictive behaviors? The Pushy Broad from the Bronx is here to talk about recovery in a language that we can all understand. Be prepared for real change by recharging the way you think, feel, and act. It's time for Recovery Recharged with Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Welcome, Transformation Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged, with the illustrious co-host, Dr. Pat. How you doing, Doc? Oh, it's great to be here, yeah. Yeah, just uh, got all warmed up here in the past hour, and I'm ready to go. This is really, <laughs> this is a powerful, powerful topic today. It, it really always is. is. Yeah, it really is. We do some great things here. This is the beginning of our third year for Recovery yeah. Recharge. We always bring to the table something that somebody can come away with, a resource, um, a situation that somebody can really learn something from. And today is no different. The topic today really says it all. And that is, does my child need help? There are so many parents out there that try so hard to help their child in so many ways. Yeah. If especially with what's happening with the pandemic, we're still not out of the woods yet. We're still in a situation that has just created an abundance of anxiety and depression, especially for teens and young adults. So I thought that I would bring on an expert today that is going to talk about how this anxiety and depression coupled with drugs and alcohol and other risky behaviors has just created a superstorm. And more importantly, what this particular doctor says we can do about it to help our children in need. So I am going to bring to the table today to Recovery Recharged, Dr. Christopher Grant. But before I have him say hi, I'm going to tell you why he's such an expert today. Dr. Grant works for Karen Treatment Centers in Wernersville, Pennsylvania, and that is a treatment center that has 65 years exper experience treating addiction and co-occurring disorders. Dr. Grant himself is the psychologist and clinical supervisor of teen and young adult male services, and he has been doing this for quite some time. He's practicing as a psychologist for 15 years. His experience is in treating individuals with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and also, of course, addiction. So, Recovery Recharge, Dr. Pat and I are very happy to welcome to our show, Dr. Chris Grant. How are you doing today, Doc? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. We're delighted. I'm going to put two questions to you right up front so we can get started. And the first one is, talk to us about how the pandemic has affected adolescents and adults. And just talk a little bit about anxiety and depression and how it correlates with substance misuse. Okay? okay. I know it's a mouthful out of the gate, but yeah. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. All right. So first off, like the pandemic as we know, has been very difficult. We're approaching our second year of this or, or rounding out year two, I guess. Right now, uh, and we are. Right now, yeah. I, I, I remember two years ago when the governor was like, let's shut everything down. And, and we knew from the start that this was gonna be totally different for all of us. So we didn't know what it was gonna look like. One of the uh, ways that has continued to affect us is that it's thrown our anxiety through the roof. And it seems like there's one thing after another that we have to worry about. And that's before we are concerned, like we have to have concerns about our families. Um, and so we have had job stresses, we have school stress, uh, we have how is this going to affect us financially? And then we have all the other things that have come, come along, um, you know, all these external you know, wars that we have to worry about and, and all that. Right? And that we just lump into this two years, which has been stressful for us all. For kids specifically, Ellen, you know, they're 
often forgotten when it comes to like how to manage these things, how to manage distress, how to manage anxiety. And it, we, we could see it showing up in them in, in different ways. Now to answer your second question about how do we notice depression and anxiety, the two things I always tell parents to pay attention to first, sleep and appetite. So if they sleep and appetite are off, then we know that there's that, that we need, probably need, need to take some action. Okay. So I, you know, I would have thought you would have said it's really something, Pat, right? Because I thought he would have said schoolwork or trouble or something, but sleep and appetite. That's kind of interesting. Does that happen to you too? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think what we're talking about here is we're talking about for the first time in a really long time, holistically Mm -hmm. looking at this Mm -hmm. holistic, right? Because a lot of times we leave this out or we leave that out or we forget really what the turmoil is, you know, um, and let me just give you one simple example. When we went through 07, 8, 9, and, you know, we did the show then too, and we had an enormous amount of listeners because nobody was working. You know, remember that point in time, people got just caught just got gone you're terminated Mm -hmm. and we never really talked about that it was as if one day you went through the hell in your life your family i had a friend of mine who was a potential human potential leader who was living in a tent in sacramento and we went through that period and we never addressed the children Hmm. We went through that and we like, dad lost the job. We lost the house. Then magically, what? We came out of it. A lot of people didn't, but we never looked at the children mm-hmm. from, that, from that generation. Right, today, well, speaking of, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, but today the world we're living in is there is some reality for today that is undeniable. And I just wonder, you know, how, how are we doing with our kids? Is anybody addressing, you know, the post-traumatic stress of COVID, the fact that we're watching war happening in front of us, mm-hmm. climate change, which kids are really affected by, they get it more than we do. And yet, as adults, we are the missing link, aren't we? All right. We have and- lost our radar to figure out what's going on. <laughs> It's, it's very true. And Pat, to your point, the, the kids that were affected back in 07, 08, and 09, they're the college students that are struggling right now. That's they're the right. ones that you know, they're, they're, they're the ones experiencing that depression and anxiety. And some of them are also, we could also loop into the, the 9-11 generation. Yeah, um, the, the folks, the kids that are growing up in this post 9-11 world, we have the benefit of knowing what life was like prior to that. It's like, we have life, we, we have the benefit of knowing what life is like prior to COVID and how to manage things. But our children, young adults, they're struggling because they're trying to figure out what's this gonna look like when it's my turn to take the wheel. And I'm not sure if we're setting them up to be, able, to be in the driver's seat. Well, you see this all day long. <laughs> And you t- and and your age group is teens to young adults, and like you mm-hmm. said, there's a lot of ang- anxiety and depression going on. So, so what do you see? How do kids come in? Be really specific with their physicality and what they're saying, and then tell me how it correlates to mm-hmm. substance misuse. When it comes to anxiety, so a couple of things that you mentioned, like we're seeing struggles in school. What used to be doing well, now my grades are dropping. Same thing with depression. I'm isolating from my family as well. My relationships with my family, with my friends, you know, they've all gone downhill. How it correlates to that substance use? Well, now, because I don't have any friends, I'm not interacting with my family. I'm isolating more. I'm using on my own. Right? I'm using as a way to cope. So we have a lot of kids who come in to us. This is, very, this is actually very common. They said over the last two years, isolating from, uh, they're isolated from their friends and their family, just gave them more opportunities to smoke. Right? 
And then same thing, their anxiety is pretty high. So they found a way to, to self-medicate, which is very common. Even kids these days will use that term because they, they're aware of what they're, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish through their substance use. So uh, do you think that there are some groups of adolescents and young adults that are more vulnerable than others to substance misuse coupled with anxiety and depression? Yeah, great question. yeah so that, is, that is a great question. But we know our, our sexual minorities, like our, our uh, adolescents, young adults who are on the LGBTQ community, they're, they, struggle, they struggle so much. And we see that quite often. Uh, they're often in hiding. They have a hard time talking about uh, their issues, feeling like, as if they're going to be judged. Um, we also have uh, even the high achievers, which we often don't think about the high achievers as being those that will uh, that will use. But they're trying to find a way to cope with the pressure that one they feel society's putting on them, and then as well the pressure that they put on themselves. And the pressure yeah. that their parents are putting on them. Oh, definitely too. I remember yeah. handling a, a working with a child in high school who was 17 years old and um, parents said, my child is great. She's just smoking socially. Okay. Um, but um, and she's very, um, she's very up on things and she's taking five advanced placement classes mm -hmm. pre-college and she's on two different sports teams and she's always moving, she's always going. There's no way that she's suffering. And in mm -hmm. the meantime, this girl trying to live up to her parents' expectations was a hardcore heroin addict because she right. could not live up to all of the things that she was supposed to. And what she thought she was supposed to do was well beyond what she should be doing. So mm -hmm. overachievers is something that parents have to look out for all the time, right? Yeah. Not only not living up to your potential, but living up to your potential and, and exceeding that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I want to go back to something you said, because you touched upon something that I think is worth mentioning again. When it comes to addiction, alcoholism, whether it's drugs, alcoholism, eating, I don't care what it is, the, the most invisible group out there at the moment. And what do I mm -hmm. mean by invisible? Um, the rate by which the numbers are coming in with addiction, right? And especially young people even though the world has changed and the United States has changed, kinda is what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that's the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just recently we saw a case in Florida where a student was suspended for mm -hmm. using or saying the word gay. So the idea of trying to remain invisible or trying to be something you're not, especially a young brown young people, how does that, how is that faring in the world we live in today? Because, you know, Dr. Grant, we've never had more things to compare ourselves to than right. the world we're living in today. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't afford those sneakers, so I'm not wearing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that is such a challenge. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly comparing ourselves. And I hear, I even hear this on the, um, the adolescent unit. Like they can, they even compare themselves on the, on the drugs that they use. Like, I know we, we focus a lot on identity and it's great because we want people to feel comfortable with who they are. And I think the risk of that as well is that it allows for so much comparison and we don't often have the language and the, the ways uh, to address it, especially with our young folks who are, who are trying to figure out, you know, how to navigate this world. Yeah. And often, you know, the way that they figure out how to yeah, um, find their way is by connecting with those who are, you know, like-minded, unfortunately, that would often involve, you know, oh, sometimes involve uh, drug use as well. And yeah, I, I understand the, the function behind that behavior while at the same time it, it breaks my heart that that's where they're uh, where they're choosing to go. Yeah. 
You're absolutely right. So, so when I talk to parents many times, and 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 when they're they're trying to make the decision how to help, many times parents say, "Well, it's just a phase, and my kid, I did it, so uh, you know, it's okay if they do it, and marijuana is not so bad, and we're legalizing it, and it's fine, and and if the kid is vaping, at least it's not nicotine or blah blah blah, yeah. all of that stuff." Doctor Grant, when what are, are the the risk factors, and talk a little bit about what marijuana does can do to a developing brain well so i'm going to ask first do you want the easy answer or the long answer <laughs> <laughs> we want the one that's going to hit home okay you know, the one that hits home yeah. so well right away there are um, immediate changes to the brain with uh marijuana use, as well as chronic long-term changes to the brain functioning. Um, and I always also remind parents, because I hear that a lot, right? Parents will say, you know, I smoked when I was, you know, in the 60s, 70s, or a lot of our parents are uh, children of the 80s. You know, they, they'll say, I did that. So why should I even bother to address this with my kid? Marijuana, cannabis now, is nothing like the cannabis that was smoked 60s, 70s. It's and even in the 80s and going into the 90s, this stuff yep. is more potent. Um, the THC levels are so much higher in the in the cannabis that we have now versus you know 30 years ago. Even I would say even up to 10, 15 years ago. Yep, that's right. right so right. that's why we have to be concerned about it. And because of how potent it is, it's causing more brain changes, more cognitive deficits compared to the marijuana that was smoked, you know, decades ago, All right? So we're seeing more memory impairment, you know, short-term memory suffers, long-term memory suffers as well, uh, more problems with attention. So I can't focus in class, which is one thing that I common, we constantly hear, even on our unit, we'll hear, they go up to school twice a day. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't focus. Changes to sleep, of course, I'm not sleeping well because I can't sleep without my stuff. You know, and changes to appetite. Yeah. And the, the changes, whereas before, you know, you'd go through a week without use and you can go, you know, the, you will see that the, um, the brain will repair itself. It's much longer now, hmm. which is unfortunate because the message is it's safer because, you know, I'm vaping it or it's, it's, you know, it's not like the stuff from the seventies, but that's such uh, a misnomer, a lot of misinformation when it comes to, you know, cannabis now. Yeah. And that really is the gap, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, misinformation, I think, is one of the greatest challenges we have of, of our technology, but also when it comes to safety and well-being. Um, you, know, you know, can we talk for a minute on availability? What do I mean? Do we have more resources available today than we did 10 years ago? Are we making any progress in that way? And I'm not talking in general because we are talking about teens. We are talking about mm -hmm. you know children. So I just want to focus on that group. I'm just curious about what you're seeing and is it easier in a lot of ways for a young person to get help? See, that's the question. I'm not even sure mm -hmm. I know the answer to. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. So I, I'm, I'm a product of the outpatient world before I was in uh, yeah. uh, residential treatment. And the, I'd like to say, yes, there is access. And at the same time, I see statistics that are, that are showing that you know, more people who want treatment are being either denied or told that they have to wait, mainly because we don't have enough practitioners. Uh, we don't have enough practitioners to share their wealth or the areas where the, the, the help is needed. There are just not enough practitioners. Um, so there is information there. Thankfully, there, there, are, there are more providers you know, doing Zoom virtual meetings, which is helpful, very helpful. Uh, there's some challenges when it comes to relationship and I don't have to get into that part. Mm. At the same time, there, the information is also out there uh, for parents to be able to research, uh, for for the teens to also be able to access, to help them to know if they, you know, if they have a problem, um, 
and what to do about it. Well, if there were more doctors like you going directly where help is needed, then there's certainly hope for us, that's for sure. On a personal mm -hmm. note, what made you decide to work for this treatment center and for this particular age group? Well, I have a passion for this age group. I started my career in mental health working in another residential facility with the same age group. It was 13 to 18 year olds at the time. Uh, and I loved it one because they're, they're kids. And I also love it because I still feel like I'm a kid. You know, we'll talk cartoons and video games and sports and all that. So, and, and it's fun. Uh, I decided to make the jump uh, to residential two years ago, which happened to be in the middle of a pandemic as well. <laughs> Strange time to make a job change. Uh, mainly because I wanted to get my get more experience and, and you know help people who are in an acute and crisis as that we see in residential and they said hey would you mind working with the kids I said absolutely yeah. I also have kids the same age uh, as the kids I work with so my own kids are the same age as the kids I work with at, at work and I tell my kids at home I'm doing what I'm doing so I can want to understand them and also have them so I can understand the kids that I work with. It helps. And then I also know about the video games that my kids are playing, which is helpful, right? Or the things that they're watching. Yeah. Um, and I can relate to them. Yeah. And I want to ask you uh, about this is, is because you just brought it up about what they're doing, what they're playing. And I was just searching so that I could bring this up and, and refer to it really quickly, but I, I know it. Um, I'm like Ellen. I work with people, especially young people in addiction and recovery. And one of the ladies about a year ago said to me, if you want to understand me, watch this television show. Uh, and the show is called Euphoria. And of course, we mm -hmm. all love Zendaya. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, we do. And whatever she's in. And I watched it and I'm hooked on it, I will say. But I'm also a little bit disturbed by it. Mm -hmm. And I try to be objective about this. And I often ask myself from a very naive perspective, is this really what kids go through? And I step back from it a little bit and I said, they really do go through this. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not as Hollywoodish. Right. Right. But they do go through it. They do go through the temptation to expose their bodies on the internet or the temptation to try a drug because it is something the latest thing or the group pressure to do things. So while the, the, the show itself at first seemed extreme, what I realized is mm -hmm. I think I've been out of the loop, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. really the question I mm -hmm. want to ask you. Where is the gap in those of us that are even in the field, but imagine parents now trying to navigate these waters. How do we help them with this? How do we help them, you know, pick up on the fact that, yeah, your kid's asleep at, at his or her desk, and that could be an issue. It's there's more to it than this, right? Right. I remember the first time uh, one of the patients I was working with actually uh, cued me onto euphoria and I, was, I rarely I rarely will watch a show like that but what he said was if you want to understand my situation exactly that show and yeah. he was living a life just like the main character yep scrape away all the Hollywood stuff right you really get what our youth are going through right um, the the drug use right the, the putting themselves in sexual situations or, you know, precarious relationships, very um, abusive relationships, the parental struggles that they have, the struggles of parents with their kids, right? Where the gap is, the gap is that as our children still want the same things generation after generation, it might just look a little different. Adults have lost how to relate to them how to have the boundaries with them that they need. Um, you know, they forgot how to provide some of that nurturing that, that children need because 
you know, adults are also feeling this pressure to maintain what society needs, sometimes keep up with other people in society. And I think that's where the, the gap, that's where the gap is. Yeah. And I, I think it's highlighted in that show as well. Yeah, it was. And the reason mm-hmm. I ask you that question, I know, I mean, I know we're talking about a number of these different things today, and mm-hmm. we're going to cover Ellen's going to really walk us through, you know, some of these other factors, right, especially around treatment. Um, what I think the show misses a little bit, and maybe I got to wait till next season, but it isn't the only show like that. But there are very few really that go to a solution based and that Mm -hmm. show does really touch on the realm of things right but that's what part of that's part two here ellen of what Mm -hmm. we're talking about because while it may be more complicated right while there may be changes from the marijuana when i grew up right while there may be fill in your own blank We now have the possibility, though, of reaching more, right? Reaching Mm -hmm. more. We have technology. We have apps. But I think we got to step up our game. What do you two think? Well, first of all, we are going to step up our game. And that's exactly what Dr. Grant is going to do when we come back yeah. from commercial break, because we're going to talk about when, when, when do we put the pedal to the metal? When do we put kids into treatment? How they get treatment? And most importantly, does treatment work? We're going to talk about that and choosing the right place. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Recovery Recharge, Dr. Pat and Dr. Grant. Welcome back, Transformation Talk Radio listeners. I'm Ellen Stewart. This is Recovery Recharged. And I'm here with Dr. Pat and Dr. Chris Grant from Karen Treatment Centers, C A R O N Treatment Centers in Wernersville, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Atlanta. Mm. 65 years of treating addiction and co occurring disorders. And I happen to know this place very well, and it's one of the top places in the country, surely. And we have an expert today in adolescent and young adult addiction and co-occurring disorders. And we are back in this conversation to talk about how do we know when it's time to tell parents or how do parents know it's time to put my kid in residential treatment? What happens, Chris? Does does something really happen where there's a great big uh, situation and the cops are called and things are happening? Or or can it be something else? Talk about that. Great question. That's a great question. So it doesn't have to be a, a major crisis situation. You know, there are times where that, that's, the, uh, that's what happens. Uh, I tell parents, you know, it's great that you trusted your gut to get your child in the treatment. Because right? sometimes I mean, we, we know our kids, we know, we know when things are off. Uh, and if we've told them and have addressed the substance use and we're not seeing a change or we're not seeing um, you know, they're uh, able to stop themselves, you know, refrain from use, or if we're noticing that they're escalating their use, switching onto a different substance, then we really know that's when it's time to seek treatment. Okay. Don't wait, of course, you know, start, you know, you can start small, do your research on your own before you decide to take that step. And uh, sometimes the problems can be addressed in outpatient. But if we're noticing that there's an escalation or there's not not a change over time, then then it's time for residential. And then, you know, I mean, I I, I don't want to just assume this question. I want to ask Mm -hmm. it directly. A lot of times parents get caught caught in the cycle of I don't know ism. And yet picking up the phone and calling y'all might be like the simplest solution to that. Right. Because if you haven't been through this, you don't know what you don't know. And mm-hmm. to think that this is going to work out like it would if your car needed gas in it and you just go pull in and refuel it, that is a major mistake. And I encourage both pa- parents and children alike to ha- reach out and have a conversation. You can't think you know this mm-hmm. if you've never been through it. Right, Ellen? Absolutely. I mean, this is a really big deal. And this is why we work and I work as a recovery coach 
before treatment, pre-treatment and post-treatment yeah. because many parents come to me and say, how can, how, how do I know the difference between a phase mm -hmm. and, and something serious? How do I know whether or not my child needs residential treatment? So tell me what you see, Dr. Grant. Talk about the, the actual kids that are in treatment. Are they, are, do they identify themselves as addicts or alcoholics or, or how do they come to you? in the first week or so of treatment. Tell us about that. Some will come right out of the gate acknowledging that they have an addiction. Now, these are also the ones who have been through maybe some treatment before, or they are coming from a situation such as they had a DUI, or oh. they, were, they have other legal issues that are highlighting, yeah, I have a problem. Right. Now, some also come in with this mis misinformation that uh, cannabis use or maybe alcohol use is okay because they see it in the community. And so they don't feel like if it's something that is acceptable, socially acceptable, then it can't be an addiction. Okay. And that's where the, you know, that, that conflict between what is reality and what's misinformation often, uh, you know, often butts heads. Yeah. A lot, I would say a lot of our guys, they may come in not saying or saying that they're not an addict, by the time they leave, we are able to show them that it's not just one thing that makes you an addict. It's, there's a set of behaviors mm -hmm. that contribute to that. Can we talk a little bit about that when you talk about a set of behaviors? Mm -hmm. Because people turn around and say, well, I, you know, can I get addicted if I do something just once or, mm -hmm. or, um, or I'm just doing this socially? How do I know that I have a problem? Okay, that's the most simple mm -hmm. and basic thing for parents to know and for children to know when they go yeah. into treatment. And let's so really break this down simplistically because as an employer, mm -hmm. like you walk through the door, I am spotting your red eyes and the fact that you are not tracking during a meeting. And I can't say anything because we just can't. We're not right. allowed to, right? But we know how to flag it. What you're about to share is going to help others, but doesn't it really start with issues of powerlessness? Powerlessness, yes. Yeah. That's like, often, yeah. I can't yes. go to school without getting a hit. <laughs> That's not normal. Mm -mm. Or I can't go to sleep without taking a hit. Right. Or I can't spend time around my family without taking a hit. Yeah. Right. And that's or, things yeah, that we'll point out. Go, yeah, or I can't go into social situations. I don't know how to party without getting high, right? Mm -hmm big right. one right i don't know yeah. how to be in a social situation without having a drink or taking a hit or doing a line or something mm -hmm. like that right the well, difference between that so mm -hmm. it's always about frequency um of use yes how mm -hmm. often and how much and how much and and if they're shifting from uh, one substance to the next which is showing the escalation in use it's also a concern because yeah. it's they're putting themselves open to like so many problems yeah. at risk for for more behaviors that you know could ultimately get them in more trouble yeah and that's also things that we point out to them lying is another one i have to lie to my parents i have to lie to my girlfriend about not using like if you have to tell someone that you're not using maybe that's a problem <laughs> you're right. You're right. All right. So I want to ask you one important question, and then I want to mm -hmm. talk to you about what actually happens in treatment and, and what somebody can expect, because because nobody really knows unless you're there. And we want to make it comfortable for parents and comfortable for parents to talk about with their children. So here's the big question. How do parents have this conversation with their child? How do they turn around to their child and say, we need to get you help and you need to go to residential treatment? How does that happen? Uh, with a lot of tears. Yeah, it's, yeah, there's a lot of tears, a lot of swallowing your pride as a parent to be able to say, you got something going on and I am not the one to help you. Right? And that's where parents have to start. Right? They have to swallow their pride. They have to understand that you know, someone else is going to be in charge of making mm -hmm. sure their child is getting better. But the best thing is that we can, we can only do this 
and do this successfully with the parent support. So we get the parents on board. So we're not just going to say, hey, we're going to do this with your child and you stay out of it. No, Mm -hmm. we're going to bring the parent in. We're going to point out parts of the, the, the relationship, the family dynamic that is probably not the only thing, but contributing to the pattern of use. Mm-hmm. Right? For parents to start that conversation though, just do your research ahead of time to say, hey, this is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm, this is what I'm noticing. And we need to take some steps to make sure that this is not, a, not an ongoing problem. Yeah. I want to just ask you about this because it does tend to be a a little bit confusing. And I just really want to to make sure we say it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. This thing that we're referencing, I I consider it um, adult past comparison. That's what I consider it, where denial leads the brain for parents not seeing that even one event of a Mm -hmm. child using or drinking at a time when 99% of the people don't, that's a flag, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about going to school, taking music lessons, performing in the band, play, I mean, you name it, we're so quick to justify because we reflect back to a past where we were doing it and it was okay. And that I think is one of the greatest disservices that we can, we can create for our kids. What do you guys, what do you both think? Well, like Dr. Grant said, today is a different world. It's just yeah. totally a different world. And understanding that the the type of drugs that are out there, the way people can access them, the, the how quickly things are accumulated. If just someone understands, it's not the world of 50 years mm-hmm. ago. It's not the world mm-hmm. of 35 years ago when I first got clean and sober. Okay, it's just not. It's a totally different world. So admitting that we have to really bring ourselves into the 21st century and learn about not only the misuse, but about the treatment, which yeah. makes it the most important thing. How treatment has evolved, because we never would have had this before. Dr. Pat, you and I, what did we have? We had the rooms. That's what we had. I, actually, we had juvie. You got, so it's like, you know, where I grew up, they, you know, you got mm-hmm. sent to like in the Bronx, you got sent to juvie, right? Tell that's, me about that's it. What I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Or in a straight jacket in Fordham Hospital like oh, me for, with an overdose, Bellevue, okay? With Thorazine. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what I had. So yeah. just knowing that these things are possible, for instance, I mean, I do know Karen Treatment Centers personally for anybody that wants to know and wants to know how to get in touch with Dr. Grant or that program. It is C-A-R-O-N.org. Please do that. Or please call me or please call me at my 800 number which is 889-1757 or go to my website Pushy Broad from the Bronx I will hook you up with the right resources and give you the answers you need to help your children but in the meantime right mm-hmm. now Dr. Grant tell us what it's like in residential treatment for for a child what happens in the course of a day what kind of treatment do they actually get and let's Canada? explain to the population that's listening mm-hmm. what we mean by residential treatment so residential treatment is just like it sounds. You go there, you're staying there uh, 28 to 30 days. Right? Uh, you have access to you know, your meals, a bed, which is fantastic. And at the same time, you're getting some really intense treatment. It's a mix of group therapy, individual therapy, family therapy, psychological assessments you know, when needed, psychiatric evaluations as well. For some patients, that also includes medication management. A typical day, you know, for our teens, there's there's school in the morning, followed by group, another group, you know, their lunchtime, their rec time, which honestly with our adolescent males, those are the two best times of their day when it's lunch and rec, right? Which I understand. They need to get some of that physical edge out of, you know, their anxiety and their depression. And there's more group in in school. And then in the evenings, they have their meetings. And talking to uh, to our residents, 
that's the time that they find that they get the most out of it, which, you know, I don't mind that, you know, even if they're not talking, to, you know, talking to me is not the best thing, you know, I can live with that. Right. But if they're able to find something meaningful through the meetings that they, that they attend, then I know that we're doing something right. Um, for young adult patients, you know, it also includes attending lectures uh, in, our, in our lecture hall, in addition to the groups and then individual sessions that they mm -hmm. receive as well. Yeah. I was really struck by the level of different programs you had. Mm -hmm. And I think we should mention some of this because what's very impressive about what you all are doing is you're really looking at some of the, the latest ways that we can reframe or change really what we're talking about recovery. I, specifically, I was thrilled to see integrative neurofeedback mm -hmm. uh, it, because we have to be able to take advantage of some of these you know, contemporary ways to address what people are going through. I mean, that's, part of the landscape also of mm -hmm. what you all provide, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, we do integrative neurofeedback. Uh, and you know, it's not for everyone, but for those that receive it and those that go through it, they talk about how much it's benefited. They think it's like some sort of like science fiction stuff that they're like, oh my goodness, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to benefit from it. And then they come out of it saying, yeah. you know what, I'm able to see one, how my anxiety you know, is impacting my life and I no longer have to hide from it. Another thing uh, Pat, that uh, we also offer is trauma programming. And, uh, and it, we provide even just the basic, this is what trauma looks like and coping skills for it. We also provide EMDR. Uh, we yeah. have a number of trained EMDR providers on campus and not just for the adults, but even for our adolescents and young adults, uh, yes. which is fantastic. Because right? I think about, all the adults that I've worked with in even in the outpatient world who continue to struggle with, uh, with uh, substance use. And they said, after a while, it's from what I went through as a kid. Like I have these memories, I have yeah. these thoughts that I, that I can't get rid of. Yeah. So EMDR is really great for this population. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And that's why I brought it up because, you know, these are the tools that those of us that are adults that live in this world, you know, mm -hmm. we count on on a regular basis because we never know from time to time what's going to pop up, what gets triggered. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, there's just so much now that you all have done to really bring the state of the art uh, solution for people. Um, you know, Ellen. I want to talk a little bit, if we could, about relapse, if for a moment. Uh, and we use that term relapse. I use the term relapse. People call it other things, like slipped, like whatever you call it. There are some people that struggle. Um, mm -hmm. What are you seeing, Dr. Grant? What are you seeing in terms of? your observation of how, how, how these young people adapt to their new world? Hmm. Well, I know I see a lot of guys who come out or who start out, I should say, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear about what this recovery life is going to be like for them. Um, and we help them to reduce all that emotion about the recovery life. So that way, when they, when they leave us and they can fly into recovery, we know that they're starting off well, right? the, the statistics show that the first 90 days after treatment are the most crucial. Right? Uh, we, Karen, we'd like to uh, um, point out that our, our patients, they, there's a 94% recovery rate that for the first 90 days but we want to continue to follow up with them. We do know that some of our patients will relapse afterward. Right? We try to tell them and we let them know that, yes, that is part of the problem. Uh, there's not one, a single thing you can do to make sure that you can't relapse. Right? That you have to make sure that you're keeping yourself accountable. You have folks around you who are going to keep you accountable. You have to admit that you're powerless to this and that surrender is going to be incredibly important. Uh, someone comes back to us after they relapse, we don't shut the door on them. We don't 
kick them down the hill, it's open arms. Doesn't matter if they're 15 and they relapse, it's still open arms. Why? Yeah. Because we want them to know that, you know, it's part of the process and we want them to receive that treatment and the care that they need. One of the best things about Karen and one of the best things about residential treatment is this. In the 18 years that I'm doing this and the 12 years that I'm in private practice, one thing stands out and is evidence-based. The longer someone spends in residential treatment, the less likely they are to relapse. The second thing I found with all of my clients is the biggest relapse rates do occur not only in the first 90 days, but in the first year of relapse. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have 36 years clean and sober. I should have had 37, but oh, well, okay. My first year was a bust. Okay. It was a bust, but this is the big thing. Parents are so afraid of putting their children in residential treatment. They think they're sending them off because they themselves have done something wrong. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Grant, I need you to address that. I need you to give them the good hard facts, all right? I need you to tell them whether or not there's a cure for this, whether or not they were responsible for this, okay? And I want you also, as we, we begin to wrap up here, tell me some of your personal success stories about kids in treatment, okay? With the five minutes we have. <laughs> <laughs> so parents need to know that you are not broken because your child goes to treatment. Okay? And I stress that, I emphasize that, and partly because that's also, if, my, if I had a child that ended up in treatment, I want to know that as well. Right. And I truly believe that. And I talk to parents uh, you know, on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis, about their child being in treatment. And I hear strong, strong individuals. I hear strong moms and dads talking about how, you know, how much it hurts, but they know they're doing the right thing. Right? And that's the important. Like you, you know your child. You can trust your gut when it comes to, you know, to treating them, to, uh, to getting them the care that they need. Right. And it is, it can be scary because you're sending your children, your child off to a place sometimes hundreds of miles away across the country, and you're not hearing from them every day, but do know that they are in, they're in excellent care. Right. Uh, so some of the, one of my favorite stories, and of course, no names, no identifying information. We did have a, uh, uh, a, an individual who came to us uh, my first summer. And he struggled. He struggled. I, we barely got him out of treatment. Right? We, I'm sorry, we barely got him through treatment. And while he was with us, he had a, a number of behaviors that we really wanted to address, but we couldn't because of um, because we were walking on eggshells with them sometimes. He leaves, goes to sober living, and he comes back to us within a year. Right? He comes back to us completely surrendered, says, I'm going to listen. I'm going to do things differently. We send him off after treatment to his sober living. I'm still here. I actually got an update from him about him last week. Yeah, he's in a, he has a job. Uh, he's going through school. All things that he said that he couldn't do the first time that he came through. And what he says, and I remember talking with him as he was leaving, um, leaving our, our facility, that he found that he can trust himself, that he knows that what, what he can do, and he can I mean, keep himself accountable. And you can allow others to hold him accountable as well. And his confidence is, in, is increased. And it's, it's great to, to hear stories like that. Because uh, frankly, uh, we also will hear the, the difficult ones. But, the, but the, that story reminds me that there is hope for, for not just for the parents, but for the patients that come through us. You know, they're going to be able to find their way um, in, in, this, uh, you know, in their recovery. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I hear those stories every single day with adolescents going into residential treatment like Karen, that's C-A-R-O-N dot org, and coming out and succeeding. We have mm -hmm. been very lucky in this country to be blessed with some really yeah. great treatment and some really great recovery coaches, right, yeah. Dr. Pat? <laughs> yeah, no, I, and that's why I really wanted you to speak to some of those services mm -hmm. that we have now found. The science of them is so instrumental. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, to really be out in front and really recognize things like EMDR or neurofeedback or other, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's even something on there for spiritual and spiritual journey. Um, 
that's important. That's what puts you all really at the top of the list. And I want to congratulate you for having that wisdom and that insight mm -hmm. into understanding that this is a changing landscape and you all have changed to address it. The other thing I wanted to thank you for is very few of the places that I've looked out have LGBTQAI plus right there. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah. thank you all enough. Thank you, Ellen, right? Yeah. You're welcome. Karen holds a very special place in my heart, and I always do want to bring the professionals to treatment, and I want to be able to show everybody that there are wonderful places out there. I want to bring them to your attention. So if you're looking for Karen, it's C-A-R-O-N.org. If you're looking for me, it's PushyBroadFromTheBronx.com, 800-889-1757. I'm here to give you a free consultation if you like, and certainly here for resources. I'm so glad to be beginning my first year, my third year doing uh, uh, recovery recharge with you, Dr. Pat. We're really doing a great job together. I love it. I can't thank you enough. And I, I, I love the support of our audience here. And I just want to say one thing for the audience to both of you. This is a feel that it's okay not to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. It is really okay because the three of us, we know that you don't know what you don't know. But the end game is we will make sure we put you in front of people that do know. And this is not a one size fits all. So get a hold of Ellen because mm -hmm. even if she is not that person, she will send you to Dr. Grant or wherever that is because that's what we've signed up for. We've signed up to help you, your family, your spouses, your children because you can beat this. Mm -hmm. yes it's 100 percent treatable yeah that's correct yep living and breathing it thank you both so much thank you benny thank, thank you. you olivia thank you jacob thank you and thank you to the best audience on the planet please pass this on please help us end this new wave of addiction thank you guys so much thanks very thank much you. all righty take care You've been listening to Recovery Recharged with Certified Life and Recovery Coach Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Don't miss your next opportunity to let me help you recharge your recovery, let go of your secrets, and change the way you think, feel, and act right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com.